All right. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, thank you so much for being patient. Uh, we wanted to make sure that all the schools that were planning to participate, both in the live audience and in the video conference, were hooked up. And now we're all here, so we'll get started. I'm Steve Perry. I'm the president and executive director of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here and actually to thank you for uh, giving some of your time this morning to participate uh, in this program. I think you're going to find it to be fun, and I hope you'll find it to be informative. And I hope years from now you'll still remember that when you were here with the great Anthony Munoz talking about what it took for him to be successful. Huh, our lights are out. What it took for him to be, uh, well, I'll wait till the lights come back. There we go. What it took for him to be successful, not only a great football player, but as a person, as a businessman, uh, and successful family man, and successful in life in general. Uh, a lot of people wouldn't know it, that this is something that we do here at the Hall of Fame. You know that one of the reasons the Hall of Fame exists is to honor great football players and, and people who have contributed to the great game of pro football. That's what we do, and we have the great uh, museum that honors them and tells their story. We also know that one of our responsibilities here is to preserve the history of pro football. And we have all the great documents and all the great footballs and all the great uniforms from the greatest players and the greatest plays. Those two things are part of our mission. But it is also a part of our mission to promote the positive values of the sport of football. And the Hall of Famers do that better than anyone else. They can talk about how the things that it takes to be a great football player are the very same life skills that it takes to be successful in life, no matter what you're trying to achieve. Skills like setting goals, being persistent, uh, being willing to get up after you've been knocked down. So when we get started here in this program, Anthony Munoz will tell you a little bit about his experiences when he was your age and during the course of his life. And what a wonderful opportunity you have to listen to not only a pretty good player, but a great, great player, the best of the best. And not only someone who has been successful in football, but as I said, someone who's been successful in life and hear from that person directly, have a conversation with that person so that you can decide for yourself what are some of the uh, points of advice that Anthony might give you that you could use to be successful in your own life. Now, I want to just uh, tell you a little bit about Anthony, and then we're going to see a video uh, of some of his playing days. But he was born in uh, California back in 1958. And when he was your age, it was already beginning to be apparent that he had some real gifts in terms of athletics. And he enjoyed playing not only football, but he was a star baseball player as well and basketball player. Uh, but he also worked very hard in school because he wanted to have a successful career. And he worked hard enough that he was able to get into college at the University of Southern California. In college, he continued to excel in sports and in academics. Uh, he obviously excelled in football, but also in baseball. Many people don't know. He was a pitcher on the USC's uh, national championship team. He was good enough that he could have played professional baseball if he had chosen to go that direction. After college, Mr. Munoz was drafted by the NFL Cincinnati Bengals. He played his entire 13-year career for that team. He's a big guy, he's 6'6", he's 278, but what made him a very special football player was his combination of skill and strength and speed and agility. All those things were God-given gifts that he happened to possess and he used them to the best advantage. We all know that he went on to have a very successful professional football career. Some of the highlights include the fact that he was selected as the NFL Offensive Lineman of the Year in 1981, 1987, and 1988. Best lineman in the league. He was named to all pro teams 11 consecutive years 
from 81 to 91. He was elected to 11 straight Pro Bowls. In 1974, he was selected to the NFL's 75th anniversary team. That is, when the NFL celebrated its 75th anniversary of existence, he was named as one of the best players to ever have played the game. He started to tackle in Super Bowls, in two Super Bowls, and since his retirement, he's gone on to a number of business ventures, including the fact that he was a sports uh, broadcaster on TV for ESPN and for Fox, and he continues to cover the Cincinnati Bengals games on TV and on radio. You might remember, if any of you saw the movie The Right Stuff, that was about John Glenn and the guys that went up to, into space. Well, Anthony Munoz was featured in that movie, and he's been in several others. Maybe he'll tell you about his movie acting career. At this point, what I'd like to do is show you a video of Anthony's uh, football playing days, and then I'll come back with a couple more comments. Anthony Munoz was a gifted player who defined the position of offensive tackle. Munoz was a great athlete with exceptional agility who played 13 seasons for the Cincinnati Bengals. Munoz dominated opposing pass rushers, and he helped Cincinnati become one of the top offensive teams in the NFL. Anthony was considered to be the Bengals' best offensive lineman, twice helping Cincinnati to the Super Bowl, and he was named to the Pro Bowl 11 times. In 1994, he was named to the NFL's 75th anniversary team. Munoz was also a deft receiver, catching four touchdowns as a tackle eligible. Absolutely. That's a short highlight, but it's impressive. Now let me tell you that Anthony Munoz, after his uh, football career, um, he and his wife, Dee Dee, spent a lot of time giving back to their community. In 2002, they established the Anthony Munoz Foundation and he's raised over $5 million that he and his foundation disperse to help students, students just like you. And uh, actually, Anthony speaks to students like you across the country all the time. He's an expert at it. He knows a lot about what it takes to be successful in life, and I'm sure you're going to benefit from his presence. The other important point about Anthony's career that I want to mention, because all of us in the Canton area are very proud about that, and that is that in 1998, Anthony Munoz received the highest honor that a professional football player can receive when he was enshrined here in the, the Pro Football Hall of Fame. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the podium Pro Football Hall of Famer, Anthony Munoz. How are you doing this morning? Awake. You awake? <laughs> okay, good. Let me tell you, I'm honored to be here. Uh, I'm looking forward to this interaction. You know, a lot of times I have opportunities to speak, but I don't get the opportunity to interact with the crowd like we will today. And, uh, and I appreciate that. Uh, at my old age, I've uh, been through a lot. I've had some great mentors that have taught me a lot of great lessons, and hopefully I can pass uh, some of that information on to you. Uh, is, before we get started, just to, to kind of just set the tone for what we'll be talking about today. Um, you know, a couple things that I do want to just kind of share with you that I've learned over the years. And uh, I've seen it through not only my athletic career, but uh, now in the business community, that uh, talent alone does not guarantee character. Talent alone does not guarantee success. It's about hard work. And I'm probably saying things that you might have already heard, but I just want to re-emphasize that. Talent alone does not automatically bring character. And talent alone doesn't automatically guarantee success. You see, because 
It's about the little things. It's about taking care of the details. You know, as a former NFL football player, it's fun to play Sunday afternoon. It's fun to play on Monday night because you know you're the one of only two teams that are playing that night. It's fun to play the game. The tough thing was practice. If you're getting ready for a test, the tough thing is studying up to that test to make sure you do well in the test. You see, for me, it was a challenge. I loved practice. We, only, we had probably four days of practice compared to one game per week. And for me, it was taking care of the details, not only on the field, every play, every rep that I got, trying to perfect what I was doing in order to be the best on Sunday. But it was in the classroom. As a professional athlete, the classroom is just as important. Studying your opponent, studying your game plan, knowing what you're going to do, taking care of the details. And the last point I'll make before we get started, I talk about talent not guaranteeing character success. You have to make it a habit. It has to be a continual habit of practicing what type of person you're going to become. It just doesn't happen overnight. You just don't wake up and you become a person of character. Because naturally, we as individuals, we're not wired that. We're not made that way. So it becomes a habit. Just like when I was playing, it was a habit for me to lift weights. It was a habit for me to run. It was a habit for me to, on the practice field to give it everything I had every single snap. See, if you just do it occasionally, you're not going to become the person you want to become if you don't make it a habit. So I just wanted to start out by, by sharing those words with you. And whatever you do, it doesn't matter if it's school, your relationships, as an athlete, whatever profession you decide to go into, it's about hard work. You can't cut corners. It's about the details. It's about those things that you might say, well, they're not that important. But in the big picture, they're very important. It's a little different for me training in Cincinnati, Ohio, in the NFL compared to training in college in Southern California. January 1st, my senior year, we played in the Rose Bowl. Think about this. You're going up here. January 1st, we played Ohio State, and it was 83 degrees. Now, fast forward, I had to train. I ran year-round. I was running in Cincinnati when I, I made Cincinnati my home full-time. So I'm running in January and February in the off-season. It's not 83 degrees. <laughs> so you have to make it a habit, and you have to be committed, because I knew that was important for me to get ready for the next season. So I did whatever I had to do. I had to layer up, and I, was, I wasn't going to miss my daily runs. So that's what I'm talking about. You have to take care of the details. It's hard work. So those are the, the words I wanted to start out with before we get started here. Um, I was told I have a few opening remarks, and those are the remarks that I wanted to talk about as we get started. So Steve, I'll hand it back to you, and then we'll get started with the session. Okay. Right here. Take that one. All right. Thanks, Anthony, for kicking things off. And as Anthony said, he would like this to be a discussion as opposed to a lecture. We want to have some interaction. He wants to make sure that we're talking about the things that you want to talk about. So the first thing I'd like to do is let Anthony know what schools are here. And I would encourage you, as I call your school name, show some school spirit, give a shout out, let us know you're here. Is there anybody here from Green High School? All right. Yes. All right. I like it. Okay. They came alive at the end there. Thank you, number 39. Now, how about the Multi-County Juvenile Attention Center? Anybody here from there? Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We got some shy people in the room today. I wonder if we can hear from the folks from Canton South High School. All right. There they go. How about McKinley High School? Thank you. Now, I'm a little bit biased. I went to Timken High School. Let me hear from Timken High School. <laughs> All right, how about Canton City Early College? Okay. 
Now, we also have a number of schools that are tied in around the state and around the country from uh, via the uh, video conferencing. And so we'll see if we can use this technology to hear from any of them. I'm going to start with Hamfield High School in Lansville, Pennsylvania. Did I hear anybody? All right. Maybe we just don't have the video or the audio. Let me try uh, Pittsburgh Carmalt High School in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Okay. They can hear us and they can see us. Lake Catholic High School in Mentor, Ohio. Okay, there's a bunch out there. Faircrest Memorial Middle School here in Canton. Oh. And then there's apparently some also on video from Canton South High School, in addition to the ones that are here. And then lastly, we have listed here Lorraine High School in Lorraine, Ohio. All right. Yes, we heard from them. So the point being, there are a lot of students in the live audience. There are a lot of students, students tied in by video conference. And we want to get started by uh, asking you to ask your questions of Anthony. And I know that there are some students here from Green who indicated they have some questions as an example, and I don't know what the name is, but who is it at Green High School that wanted to ask a question about preparing for college? Would you like to stand up and ask your question to Anthony? <laughs> My experience growing up was, I guess it's not that much different than a lot of students, but uh, first of all, realizing that once you get to college that you don't have mom or dad there waking you up, and when you push the snooze button, they're there to wake you up again afterwards. Uh, my mom raised five by herself, so we had to get up in high school. We had, uh, we had the responsibility, again, that's one of the character traits. We had the responsibility of getting up and making sure we got to school or else we paid the consequences afterwards with mom. So I would recommend that you start thinking about that now. Maybe taking the responsibility yourself of making sure that you get up and that you put a time management schedule together because that's what it's going to encompass once you get to college. You're not going to have someone holding your hand there making sure you wake up, you go to class, you do your homework, that you do all the things you need to do to be successful. So that's that's maybe something that you start now, is, is really saying, okay, mom or dad or mom or whoever, you know, is that I need to start learning this in high school. And, and I think, again, I talked about character, success being a habit. You establish that habit now. And, uh, you know, then that way when you get into college, that helps you. And, you know, I realized that I had a, a jump on, you know, on the on the game when I got to college because as a high school student we had to do that anyway we you see my mom was gone at six in the morning she'd worked two and three jobs to provide for us so we had to make sure that we took care of getting ready eating breakfast and then going to school okay great now I have a, a question one from Canton South and also from Faircrest and I'm going to combine the two because the one said what was uh, something that you influenced in your young life that was the most positive influence? And when you were young, what was the most negative influence that you had? I think I can answer that with kind of grouping the same things together. Is, and I thought about that question. The thing that really influenced me positively was growing up without a father. And that can be a negative too. So I can kind of answer the same thing. Because growing up without a father, never, I'm 54 years old and I'll never meet my dad because he's dead. He's passed away. He was in and out of prison when I was growing up. He was a drug addict. So I knew those things about my dad. So that, to me, that was a positive because I wanted to grow up not going that direction. I wanted to grow up and, and be successful and do something positive in my life because of, of that. And my mom, alongside that, really taught us at home what work ethic was all about. There was other people in my life that taught me things. But when I, as a kid, watching my mom work as hard as she did, we learned work ethic. So the fact that I didn't have a dad really was a positive influence on me. And also the negative 
had to be the things that were happening around me, the drug addiction, the alcoholism, that really was a negative and could have very easily gone down that path, but I decided not to. So I had a lot of negative around me growing up, but I used it as a positive. So, you know, there was, um, there was those things that, uh, that were part of my life growing up as a kid in Southern California. Now, I think you just heard something really b very profound. You know, a lot of us think when we see a successful person in music or entertainment or sports or politics or whatever it might be in education, we say, well, that person was lucky. They had it made. They had it easy. They don't have all the problems and challenges that I have. That's not always true. Here's a person who grew up without a father in his home, grew up in a neighborhood where he had to deal with drug and alcohol and negative influence, just like everyone else, just like all the rest of us. But the key is to not let the negative things overwhelm you, to turn them into positives, as you've heard Anthony say he did. So don't always think that because someone is exceptionally uh, successful that it was an easy road. It was every bit as hard as the road that all of us have to travel. You just have to turn it in to something good. Now, I want to ask if there's a student from Canton South. A lot of you ask questions. I don't know what the names are, but is there a Canton South student in the room who'd like to stand up and ask Anthony a question? And we'll get a microphone to you. Anybody? Don't be shy. <laughs> Somebody who's courageous in Canton South. This whole program is about being cur courageous. There's a young man right there. There's a mic. Hello. Um, <laughs> all right. Um, how has the NFL really like changed your life from then, like when you were growing up like that till now? Like, how have you, like, how's it changed your life like so far? You, you talk about my playing days. During my playing days, well, you know, I talked about the transition from high school to college. In college, you know, you have your classes that you have to attend, and you got football practice, so you have to really be able to balance all that. But now, all of a sudden, you move into the NFL, and that's my job. I mean, you know, the amazing thing is I did something for 13 years that I loved to do, and I got paid for it, got paid well. But now it's my job. So I have, again, going back to one of the character traits, responsibility. Have the responsibility of not only during, like in college, you had the summer off. You know, from class, you still had to train. But now, in the NFL, you have to train year-round because it is your job. You have to be in shape. You have to study. I mean, where in college you had limited hours of studying your opponent, now, during the day as an NFL football player, we might get there at 7.38 in the morning, and we might leave at 4 or 5, but only an hour and a half to two hours is on the field. So figure it. I mean, the rest of the time is in the classroom. So you're studying, you're studying, you're studying. So it becomes a full-time job. So therefore, it, it does change your life because now you're providing for your family. I mean, I got married in college, but we didn't start a family until I got in the NFL. So now I'm providing for my wife, and all of a sudden I have a couple kids. So now I'm the provider of my family. So. Those are the changes that you get when, you know, I went from college to the NFL, is that the responsibilities as an individual increase. Therefore, you need to really, you know, buckle down and, and make sure you take care of everything you need to take care of. And, and my whole thing was, and one of the things, let me just go back a little bit, and I think I can kind of piggyback that with what Steve, the point he made when I shared about my upbringing. You know, Every time I, I speak a lot, and when I go out to speak, when I'm introduced, they show the video of my NFL career. They share, you know, the Pro Bowl, the Hall of Fame, the NFL, all NFL team. But I love to share the journey because not only growing up was it tough, but people say, okay, well, you played and went to school at USC, so it must have been great there, and then you transitioned into the NFL. We all go through obstacles and adversity, and I think the thing that really got me ready also for the NFL is that when I went to USC, I had plans of, you know, playing in Rose Bowls and national championships and playing this. And, well, I had three knee operations in four years at USC. I only played one healthy season in four years at USC. So the things I learned as a kid about hard work and not taking shortcuts, now I really had to put into action because I couldn't really take the time and feel sorry for myself. I couldn't take the time and just eliminate myself from my teammates and 
not go to school and, and just kind of let that affect me. I had to really now focus even harder because for three years out of four at USC, I was rehabilitating the knee operation. And even my senior year, not knowing if I'd even get a chance to play in the NFL, and the thing we all are going to deal with, we're going to deal about naysayers, those that say that we can't do something. You see, I got hurt in the second series, the first game my senior year. So I missed the entire season. But I knew what I had to do. I knew the, the task in front of me. I had to be diligent. I had to be persistent. I went to school. I trained. I rehabbed. And I was married at the same time. Well, I rehabilitated a knee operation. And in the three years prior to my senior year, we had played in two Rose Bowls. And I hadn't played in one yet. I wanted to play in one. So I rehabbed. And the only game I played my senior year was the Rose Bowl after only playing two series of first game. So not only was it up to me to get back, but think about the resources you have that you have access to in high school with teachers, mentors, parents, and utilize those resources. I realized that I had resources on the college campus with tutors, with trainers, with doctors, and I could say that all of those helped me get through college, especially having the opportunity to play in that Rose Bowl and then as Steve mentioned, if you caught it, the Bengals drafted me in the first round with the third pick after missing my entire senior year and not knowing if I was even going to play in the NFL. So I guess the point I wanted to make is that we can't sit there and say, whoa, am I, I have it tough. Because I know a lot of us in here have had it tough, and I know we have it tough. But you've got to take it regardless to your circumstances, regardless to your adversity, and you just got to move forward. You just have to do the, be responsible, take it upon yourself to work as hard as you can, and it might not happen in the direction that you might want it to happen. You might have to take a detour and be successful in another area. But I would encourage you to just continue to work and not listen to those that are saying, you can't do that. See, after I had that third knee operation and played in the Rose Bowl, you would not believe how many people were saying, you can't play in the NFL. You'll never play a down in the NFL. And the way I used that motivation of not having a father growing up as a kid and used the motivation of my mom showing us work, I used the motivation of those naysayers saying, you can't play in the NFL and saying, I think I can. I think I can. Isn't there something? That, oh, you guys are a little old for the train that no oh, can. But, <laughs> but uh, so I just wanted to, to add that. Great. I'm going to ask if there's a question on this side of the room, anybody? We have a microphone for you. Who's got a, a question they'd like to ask Mr. Munoz? Anybody? Somebody? Going once. I think I saw somebody. You're, that man right there has an expression on his face like he wants to ask a question. Let's get a mic to that young man about middle back there. <laughs> anybody? Stand up and ask a question for Mr. Munoz. <laughs> There's one, a little farther over. Thank you very much. Um, who is the toughest defensive lineman you played against? Or, yeah, defensive lineman. Who is the, defense, the toughest defensive lineman that I ever played against? Um, there was a lot of them. <laughs> um, as a left tackle in the NFL, uh, usually week in and week out, uh, I'm playing against the best pass rusher. Uh, and again, that goes back to preparation. Uh, really preparing yourself. No different than playing against Bruce Smith, who's in the Hall of Fame, or Leroy Selman, who's in the Hall of Fame, or Fred Dean, who's in the Hall of Fame, that I had to play against. I had to pre prepare myself. I had to have the responsibility of getting ready for Sunday afternoon when I played against them. And I, and I tie that in. I share that because now, as a student athlete or as a student in high school, you need to do that. I could ask you, what's your, tough, what's your toughest subject and what is your toughest test? I'm going to just, just as a, you have to prepare yourself. If it's math, if it's English, if it's science. To me, you ask that question and I had to do the things that you're doing now as a student. I had to take Tuesday, or Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday and prepare myself to hopefully play against the best that I ever played. And I'd probably have to say the best one is Bruce Smith. And hopefully I could go out and, and play well and, and grade well on my final exam on Sunday. So uh, 
I know I added a little more to your question, but I just wanted to kind of incorporate that into what we're talking here uh, about to here today. And uh, so I named a few of them, but probably the best all around again is, was Bruce Smith from the Buffalo Bills. All right, I'm going to ask a question that I have on the list that came from uh, Faircrest Memorial Middle School. Someone wants to know, at what age did you begin to realize that you had special talents and gifts as an athlete? You know, I have two older brothers. I have a brother that's two years older than I am and a brother that's eight years older than I am. And I started playing baseball when I was six years old. Uh, that was my childhood dream, was to be a major league baseball player. Um, mainly because I didn't totally understand everything that went along with it, but I thought if I could make it in the major leagues, maybe I could buy my mom a house. That was my goal, and, to, and that's something I loved. So at the age of six and seven, we, to answer your question, I was competing with my brother's friends that were two years to five years older than I was. Um, and I was playing uh, mainly because I was a pretty big kid. But God blessed me with um, baseball talent at a very young age. Uh, even in high school, I was a three-time All-State as a third baseman and a two-time All-State in football, even though I went on to play college football in the NFL. Baseball was really the talent that I noticed early in my life. And I'd say probably six, seven, eight years old, I realized that uh, it was something that I loved and something that I could excel at a high level and, and played very competitive at a very young age on the baseball field. Okay. Now, here's a tough question, some that I'll bet your parents and teachers have to deal with. This is a question from a student at Green High School. It says, uh, kids our age face a lot of pressures, maybe some pressures that you didn't face when you were our age. What advice would you give to us to deal with those pressures, including drugs and alcohol pregnancy? That's a great question. Um, and what I can say from experience, and I know it's a lot tougher now because I'm much older than, uh, you know, growing up, I'm not growing up now, but I just have to share it with my experiences. And that was, when I got into the NFL, I was faced with some temptations. What I would recommend to you is that you can be a leader. You can be a good leader or a bad leader. I mean, there's just no way to, to look away from that. So what I decided early in my life is that I wanted to be an influencer in a positive way. So let's say maybe one night you're faced with drinking, and let's say you don't do it. You're sitting there on an island all by yourself, okay? My goal was to get, is get so many people on that island that it got crowded, and that was my goal as an NFL football player. Is I wanted to be a positive influencer, and the only way I was going to do that is to stay away from drugs and alcohol and all the temptations that can either ruin your life or destroy your life. And that, that's what I would, and that's what I share with my kids. I have two kids. My wife and I have two kids. Well, they're grown adults now. But we went through the same thing. It's not that long ago that they went through high school and college, um, and now they're married. But we had to deal with the same thing as parents. And, and that's the same message that we shared with them. It's easy just to get involved with those things. The tough thing is to step back and say, I don't need those things, and I'm going to influence those that are involved in a positive way, and I'm going to bring them on the island with me. And again, you might be standing on that island for quite a while. And again, like I talked about, it's a habit. The more you make it a habit of not doing those things, the easier. It's not going to be easy, but the easier it becomes to stay away from those things. And then all of a sudden, you have more and more people that are going to be thinking and wanting to do what you're doing. And so that's the advice I give you, is to stay away from that. And look at, look at the long-term effects, because we're, su we're such a temporary satisfaction or, or quick satisfaction um, society. I mean, we got the, the drive through we got the microwave. We have so many quick things at our fingertips and drive. We want things, it's that waiting for, you know, the long-term and looking down the the road, and, and that's the thing that I look back to when I got in the NFL at 21, and now, as I'm much older, I look at, and I'm thankful that I, I stood back and didn't get involved in those things, and even prior to the NFL, and that I could come out and, and really at least speak with some credibility, and not say that I'm perfect, that I've not made mistakes, because I have through my life, I've made mistakes, but that I can really encourage each and every one of you to do that as we did for our children and now uh, you know they're married and raising kids now and, it, and it's exciting to see that they have become solid citizens and I'm thankful that they are. Okay great. Now I want to ask uh, since we're talking here at the Pro Football Hall of Fame and we're obviously talking to the Hall of Famer 
How many, by show of hands, in the room are uh, play sports? Uh, and I imagine a lot of you guys are, uh, are, are in uh, sports like football, maybe basketball. I know that I see some basketball players. Does anybody in here play football on the defensive line, offensive line? Okay. So I'm going to use that to lead into this question. There's a guy back there who was probably about the size you were when you were in high school, Anthony. <laughs> Good size. <laughs> Muscular looking. But uh, one of the questions we have, and I think it was from uh, Canton South, that said, I know you love football and you wanted to play, but were there ever times that you really just got sick of it and wanted to quit and not play anymore? Were you ever faced with giving up on your dream? Um, I wouldn't say there was a time when I wanted to give up or quit um, until I was old and starting to break down. I was going to retire. But um, it might have been the, the twice, the two times we lost to Pittsburgh in my 13 okay. years. But uh, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I couldn't, I couldn't resist that. But um, no, it, it was, um, for me, it was more frustration. Um, for me, it was, I hated to lose. I really hated to lose. Um, but it, it wasn't to the point where I wanted to quit. Um, it was to the point where it motivated me even more to, to become a better player, to become a better team player, to try to inspire guys around me. But, um, you know, I can't say that um, really through the, all the years that I was uh, playing sports, I, I just did not like it that I wanted to quit because I, I, I loved being active and I love being active now. Uh, of course, I, I can't move as quick as I used to and do the things, but I still like, you know, going out and exercising and trying to stay active. But uh, it just was ingrained in me, and I just loved it at a very young age. That uh, even though we had some tough seasons with the Bengals and in high school, uh, it just motivated me to motivated me to work even harder. Uh, but not to the point where I said, I, "Do I really need this? I don't need to be doing this." Okay. Now I'm going to ask for a question from this side of the room. In a second. Oh, T.O. in the back? Certainly. Let's get a mic. What may, and USC, USC had a great baseball program. Could you have played baseball at USC? I, I actually did. Uh, when I, was, when I, I was being recruited out of high school, um, even though it was... I was being recruited to go to school and play football across the country. Every recruiter I spoke with, I said, well, I have the chance to play baseball. And of course, recruiting talk, they all said yes, of course. Uh, but USC is, it was a childhood dream of mine, and they had a track record of letting guys play baseball, even if you're on a football scholarship. Uh, so when I decided to go there, uh, but it was very limited because of the injuries I talked about. Uh, I had a chance to play one year at USC, and it worked out pretty well. The one year I played at USC, we won the World Series. So I got a national championship the one year I played. But at 6'6", about my senior year in college, I was about 290, 300 pounds right now. I figured football was probably the, the avenue I'd go. But I still, even that one year I played baseball, I had some great coaching, some great teammates, and I still wanted to play more after that at USC. But because of injuries, I didn't have a chance. So... Uh, I did experience the World Series, and we had a great team. Even now, I have some great uh, friends that I made off that baseball team that I still stay in contact with. So basically, injuries kept you from going on to a pro baseball career. Well, I don't know if it kept me from going on to a pro baseball career, but it kept me from playing more at USC. I, I still, as I look back, I still, I really believe that football was the route I was going to take, but I, I wish I could have played more baseball in college. Thank you, Tio. Thank Any, you. Another question on this side? There's a gentleman who has his hand up. Um, through high school, I mean, uh, college in the NFL, what was your pregame ritual that you did? My pregame ritual, and uh, I'm pretty simple. I, I, um, yeah, I love getting to the, the stadium early, and just uh, I would just sit there, and I'd basically do a lot of stretching. For a big guy, I stretched a lot. Um, Early in my NFL career, I'd go out on the field, uh, but then after that, I would just basically stay in the locker room and just talk to the guys, maybe uh, continue to go through my game plan just to, to know it even better. But 
I just mainly just like laying around, uh, pretty low key. I wasn't a, a guy that uh, rant and raved and uh, you know scream and yelled. And I, I just liked relaxing. To me, the more I could relax, I think the better I would go out and perform. And uh, I really liked stretching as much as I could. That's what I did uh, before every game. All right. Thank you. I'm going to ask a question because it relates to that a little bit. Um, what sort of coaching or teaching impacted you the most? You know, there's different coaching styles. Right. Some are sort of in your face. Some are more different. What sort of coaching and teaching uh, uh, did you react to? I preferred the, the great word you used. I preferred teachers. To me, coaches are teachers, no different than in the classroom. And that's what I, I preferred because I was – I'm, I'm really big on technique. I'm big on details. And quite frankly, and my line coach that I had for 13 years, I had him my whole NFL career, he knew that I didn't like the screaming and yelling. And basically, I did not hear a whole lot of that. But if he was to sit me down on the field and go through technique, I was like a sponge. I wanted to hear. I wanted to ask questions. So those are the guys that I reacted to and really responded to were give me, give me, technique, give me facts, give me things that are going to make me a better player on the field. Screaming and yelling at me is not going to make me a better player on the field because um, from a young age, I pretty much had to be a self-starter, a self-motivator, uh, and that was, you know, for 13 years in the offseason, I did all my running basically alone. I went to the local high school, and, and quite frankly, a lot of guys didn't want to come and run with me because they said you run too much for a lineman. I said, well, for me, I felt that was good for me. But uh, so, you know, I, I preferred the guys that were just going to lay it out and say, okay, here's what we have to do. And, to, and some guys are different. Some guys need the screaming mm -hmm. and yelling. But I just, uh, I wasn't wired that way. Okay. Now I'm going to ask a question off the list from uh, the school in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And it says, what's your opinion about today's athletes, especially the superstar athletes, do they approach the game in the same way that you approach the game? You know, I can only answer that question looking from the outside in. Um, my opinion about the athletes today, there's no question. They're bigger, faster, stronger. Um, I'm not convinced that they're technically as sound as, let's say, 5 to 15 years ago. But maybe it's because they're such great athletes. The athleticism kind of takes over. Um, you know, it's a, it's a totally different game now. I mean, I can't imagine having guys on my team when I was a member of the Cincinnati Bengals tweeting out or on Facebook, uh, that just wouldn't fly with the guys that I was playing with. Um, you know, there's a, to me, there's a lot of self-promoting, self-marketing. It's still a team sport. I, and I'll say it today, and I said it back when I was playing, if you're a boxer, if you're a golfer, if you're a tennis player, single, then it's all about self-promotion, self-marketing. But it takes over 50 guys to win a football game, so it's about a team. But uh, I still love watching the game. I still think it's, to me, the best team sport. And I respect all the other team sports, but the best team sport uh, in the world. Because you look at the diversity of guys that you bring together trying to accomplish one goal, and that's win games. And you can have a 320-pound guy, and you can have a 180-pound guy, a guy that benches 500, a guy that benches 300 on the same football field trying to accomplish the same goal. Um, so it's... Um, I think it's still a great game, it's still a team, but it definitely has changed a lot. The, the collisions that are taking place are uh, more violent, um, but uh, that's the way the game's played, and that's what I love about the game. So. Great, thank you. All right, is there a hand? Question Let me get here. another question from anywhere in the room. Right there, young man. What was your relationship like with your family members and like your siblings and your mom when you were young and then as you progressed through life? Um, my relationship with my family um, has been very good. It hadn't been great. I mean, because we've, I hadn't found them a whole lot. I got married when I was 19, so I was kind of out of the house, um, really starting my own life. I was in college. They were at home. Then I moved to Cincinnati. Um, now that I go back, we have a good relationship. I get a chance to see them, but not as much as I'd like to. Um, so there isn't a, a deep relationship there with the siblings. Uh, but it's, it's a, I think it's a good relationship. It's, um, it's not a relationship that I'd love, that I, you know, I'd really love to have a more in-depth, because I, I love relationships, I love being around people, but it is what it is because of the distance that we live from each other. But uh, when I go back home, uh, and Steve knows I love to play golf, I'll play golf with the high school coach, and I'll play, usually play golf with my older brother. 
And all my siblings are in Southern California, but I have a brother that's been in Houston, Texas for a few years. And I'll get down there occasionally. When I do get down there, I have a chance to see him. So I don't see him a whole lot more than I see my relatives, my family out in California more. But uh, I think for the most part, it's, it's okay. Yeah. Okay. Another question? Anybody? There's one right there, middle. Uh, can I get your autograph? <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's something we have to, after the session, I think we'll have some time to, to mingle and, and do that. So, All right, but since you have the mic, and in order to get that autograph, let's have a question. Yeah. Uh, what was, like, practice like in the NFL? Practice. practice? Yeah. Practice was pretty intense. You know, the funny thing about practice is that we were, the, we were members of the same team, and we knew that Sunday we had to go out together as a team and, and beat whatever team we were going to play against. But during practice, there was such intense – um, competition between the offense and defense, at times you, you sit back and you go, okay, are we teammates or are we not? So it was pretty intense. On the practice field, it was pretty intense. And then in the meeting room, it was time to really focus. And, uh, and, and you might be tired, especially as you get further into the season. You have to understand, as I mentioned, my senior year in college, I played one game. My, in, in college, I played, I think, maybe 24, 25 games in four years. My first two years with the Bengals, I played 43 games because we went to the Super Bowl the second year. So we have four preseasons, six, 16 regular seasons, then the second year the same thing, and then the playoff games. So you had to be disciplined mentally because week 14, week 15, your body is aching, and then you get into the meeting room and you've got to focus and study. So uh, I'd say pretty much it, the word to use is intense preparation. We had a young lady right here that had a question. Who did I look up to when I was younger? There was a, of course, my mom was one of nine kids, and I had, she had four brothers, so I had four uncles around, and they really were involved, so uh, I really looked up to them. Uh, when I was seven years old, I met a, a, a coach that was the head of Parks and Recreation where I was growing up, and then later on, I started at third base for him for three years. He was the varsity baseball coach at my high school, and now I still have a great relationship with him. And, you know, the neat thing about him, Jim Seaman, is that he was a great baseball mind, great athletic mind, but not only did he teach us about sports, but he taught us about character. He taught us about how to do things the right way, you know, hard work, not cutting corners, being a person of character. So it was a couple uncles and then uh, a baseball coach that I had that, that I really looked up to that uh, had an influence on my life. Okay, great question. Another question from the audience? Yes, ma'am. There's a young lady there. A couple of them. Um, that's a great question. I took it as a learning experience. We need to take, and adversity is the same thing, adversity, losing, and it's much easier to win. It's tough, we, and we shared that with our kids. Is that the lesson is in the losing. You've got to take that and learn from it, because if you're losing, you're not doing things the way that you should be. If you score uh, badly on a test, the result is you're not studying. So you need to take that as a lesson. And that's what I did. When, when we lost a game, I went in and with the microscope, I knew the coach was going to do it, first of all, but myself as a player, I took what I did with the microscope. And I really wanted to work that next week and improve. So that's what I, that's what I took away from losing, is that I took it as a, a learning experience and I wanted to get better the next time I had the experience of trying to, to win a game or do something that I lost. So yeah, that's what I did. I think that is a great question. I know in the case of my own kids, when they don't do well on a test, they're older now, but when they were younger, they thought that meant that they didn't have the ability. They thought they meant that if they scored poorly on a math test or a science test that, well, I guess I just don't have the ability. I think what Anthony's pointing out is if you go back and review how you might improve, you may find that you have the ability way beyond what you scored on that first test. Great question. Another question from the audience? Several on this side. What, do you, what pillar of characteristic do you think is the most important? You know what, there's a lot of great ones here. Um, in, and if you haven't noticed already, the one that I continue to use is responsibility. 
because responsibility, we, we have to take the responsibility to, to get things done. But then on the other hand, in, we have to take the responsibility when we do things wrong or we fail and not blame others. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand, but I would just throw this question out there. How many, if not us personally, how many times have you heard somebody do something wrong or fail and blame somebody else instead of taking the responsibility and say, hey, I've messed up. I made a wrong decision. I, I got to take the responsibility. So I would think for me, responsibility is, is you know, and again, there's a lot of great ones there in the six pillars, but I would say responsibility is the one that I continue to use and, and I see as being very important in who we become as people. All right, thank you. Can we get that other young lady in this area that had a question? Or young, whoever? Right here in the there second row. Okay. You said earlier on that you have a foundation that you started. Yeah. Um, what was your drive behind starting that foundation and can you kind of explain to us what it is? Yeah. If you didn't hear the question about my foundation that is now 11 years old, what was my drive and, and what are we all about? Um, I think for me, um, the mentors I had in my life that gave allowed me to accomplish some dreams when as a family we might not have been financially uh, able to do that. Uh, I talked about earlier taking advantage of resources. There was people that taught, it, taught uh, me about giving back. Uh, so when I was playing, I realized that I had a platform. And remember I said you can be a good leader or a bad leader? I think as an athlete, I saw it when I entered the NFL that I could use the platform I was given in a positive way or a negative way. And I wanted to use it in a positive way and really build a team to give back to individuals that might not you know, have the resources. A lot of talented young people out there but might not have the resources to do things. So that's what really what drove me to, to start the foundation. Uh, and basically the way I... I elevator speech is education, character, and leadership. And we start with from second to fourth graders with the one-on-one -on -one mentoring program. We do it once a week throughout the, throughout the whole school year, and then we do other events with them in addition to mentoring them. For junior high students, we have overnight character camps, mainly young men. We'll take them, and it'll be a football camp. We use football as a platform, but in the four days that we have them, three nights, four days, we might only teach them 55% of the time football. The other times we teach them character traits like we're talking about here, team building. We put them up on 20-foot and 40-foot rope courses so they can you know, work as, team, as a team to get through it. So we have those overnight character camps. We have a leadership seminar where every year we have a minimum of 100 high schools. We bring them in. We have motivational leadership speakers. We have breakout sessions about leadership. And then the students go back to their respective campuses. And then we send them out in the community with the charge that they initiate and put together community service projects from mentoring programs to rebuilding parks or whatever it is they, they put together. Then we track those programs and I pick two winners and I reward them with some money that they can use uh, in their school. And then the last thing we do is we, I give out 23 scholarships a year. We give out 18 two to 5,000 one-time scholarships, two to 5,000 dollars, and then in June we give out six $20,000 scholarships for high school students to attend local colleges in that area. So we, you know, that's the way I, uh, my mission statement is to engage the tri-state area, the area I live in, to engage the tri-state area to impact youth mentally, physically, and spiritually. So those are the programs that we do for, uh, for young people. And when you say tri-state, what are the states? Tri-state is the greater Cincinnati area, southeast uh, Indiana, and northern Kentucky. Okay. It's known as the tri-state area there. All right. Indiana, Ohio, and Kentucky, down at the south part of the Ohio. Thank you. Another question. Anybody on this side right with a here. question? So, yep. Where is it? Right there. She had her hand up. Okay. Um, earlier you talked about who was the toughest. Excuse me one second. Well, the gentleman on this side, let's pay attention to this question and to Anthony's response. Thank you. Earlier you talked about who the toughest person was you faced. I was wondering who was the toughest team you had to face. Toughest team. Wow. There was a lot of great defenses when, when I was playing. Um, back when I was playing, a lot of you might know, we had the AFC Central, which is the AFC North now. Of course, the Ravens weren't around. The Ravens were in Cleveland before the second Cleveland team was. So it was the Cleveland Browns, the Pittsburgh Steelers, the Bengals, and the Oilers. And those teams throughout my career always had great defenses. Um, and then other teams that had uh, great defense, the Raiders always had some great defenses. Um, Cowboys, 
uh, Philadelphia Eagles uh, back in the 80s with, uh, I'll throw some names out there and you can go research if you don't know already. Uh, Reggie White, he's in the Hall of Fame. Then they had guys like Jerome Brown, who we lost at an early age. He was a great football player. Um, Clyde Simmons, Seth Joyner. Uh, they had great defense. So those are just some of the teams that, uh, that had great defenses and uh, knew that every time we prepared for that team, um, we had to be in the top of our game. Okay, great. There's a question here. Real quick question. Sure. Um, the first one is in 30 or 40 years down the road, when people think about and talk about Anthony Munoz, what do you want them to remember about you, football or career, life, whatever? And the second, you hear guys talk about what it means to be in the fraternity that is the Hall of Fame and the 200 and some players that are in the Hall. What's it mean to you to be a Hall of Famer? Okay. First question's easy. Um, if you didn't hear the question, what do 20, 30, 40 years down the road, what do I want to be remembered as or who do I want? Um, if, all, if the only thing you knew about me uh, was that Anthony Munoz is a God-fearing man that wants to be obedient to what, the way God wants him to live, and the reason I do what I do is because of my motivation through Christ, that's it. That's, that's what I want to be known as. Uh, and then if you know that I played a little football and had two kids and hopefully uh, we got six grandkids and maybe 10 to 15 grandkids, that's fine. But um, that, that said it all in the first couple sentences. That's how I want to be known. Uh, that's what I want my legacy to be. Uh, what's it mean to, to wear this gold coat and to be a, a part of uh, this great fraternity? Uh, this year coming up, I'll be f in the Hall of Fame 15 years, which is amazing in itself. And I'm still very humble uh, and I'm still thrilled. I drive up from Cincinnati every summer for the induction uh, ceremony, and one of the, the one things I make sure I have packed is my camera, because I, I, you know the guys that I'm here with, I love taking pictures with. It's quite an honor. Um, it's still hard to believe that I'm a member of the Pro Football Hall of Fame, and it, it means a lot. Uh, it means, again, a responsibility to really represent not only the guys that I'm in here with, but the Pro Football Hall of Fame and uh, the National Football League with the highest integrity the highest character, and that's the way I look at it, that it is a responsibility. Uh, it's, it's been an honor that I've been given. Um, not something that I, I look at it as that I, I was, should have been given to, you know, but it's something that I was honored to be a part of this great uh, group, and, and that's how I feel about it. So it's, it's pretty special. And we don't wear this coat that often during the year. Uh, this year I've probably worn it, the, I think this is my, Maybe my fourth time that I've worn it this year. And usually it's just uh, one weekend. And that's the uh, first weekend of August in Canton, Ohio. But uh, we've been wearing it a little more uh, at different events. So I get excited when I get a chance to put it on. Well, that obviously is a great question and a great answer. First of all, as it relates to that Hall of Fame gold jacket, it symbolizes being the best of the best in your chosen field of endeavor. And obviously that's what Anthony has done. But part of what this program today uh, is about is that to have Anthony plant some seeds or thoughts in your mind about how you could be the best of the best. Wouldn't it be great when you're Anthony's age, if you're sitting on a stage somewhere and someone asks you how you'd like to be remembered and you're able to give an answer that is exactly how he will be remembered as a person of character, as a person who exemplifies the pillars of trustworthiness, responsibility, citizenship, all those things, you can ask that same question of yourselves. You're not too young to ask that question of yourselves. How would you like to be remembered? What is it that you would like to achieve in life? The purpose that Anthony's here today and the purpose of this whole program is to have you think about that. I would tell you that when I was your age, I thought, well, that's something I'll get to down the road. Maybe two, three, four years from now, I can start thinking about my longer-term career. But really, Anthony did some of these things when he was six and seven years old. You are proud, many of you, I'm sure, are doing some of the same things. You're beginning to think about, who am I? What am I going to try to achieve with the talents that God has given me? And I thought it was very important that Anthony said that many of you have talents, lots of talent, either athletic talent or academic talent, whatever the case may be. But he also said that talent alone doesn't guarantee character. Talent alone doesn't guarantee success. And he also, as he talked about football, reminded us football is the ultimate team sport. 
And one of the things that teammates do is they help one another. I love his example of being a positive leader. There's a lot of people, and probably a lot of them in this room, who have leadership abilities. Question is, are you going to use your leadership to help people move in a positive direction? Or are you using your leadership to move people in a negative direction? Are, are you willing to stand on an island like Anthony said he does and, and bring people over to the positive side? Or are you one of those guys who jumps over to the negative because it's easy? Again, the purpose of this uh, program this morning is to have you all think about that uh, today. And when you leave here, continue to think about what you've heard Anthony say. Now, we do have time for one or two more questions, so I'd like to offer. I just, uh, Shirley. I just want to add, real quick before you ask the question, I just want to add to Steve's the great, great points he made is that, you know, I, I had some coaches started giving me some of those nuggets at a young age, but to have a setting like this, to be able to hear people that have really gone through life and, and accomplished things, I've never had that opportunity. And every time I get this opportunity, mm -hmm. I'm thrilled to be able to do it because, I mean, how fortunate you are at your age to start hearing a lot of these things and to really start you thinking about what it means to be a person of character and how you can be a positive leader. I mean, I would have loved to have these opportunities in high school. I never really had these. So I, I just want to share, you know, why I love doing it and how I wish I would have had settings like this to hear from individuals, which I never did. Great. There's a question on this side. Yes. Um, um, what happened to your pinky? <laughs> <laughs> what happened to why is there something wrong with my pinky? Um, that, I guess when you play over 20 years of football, that kind of <laughs> that kind of happens. Uh, it doesn't hurt. It still works, so don't feel that bad. But it looks ugly, but it, it uh, it's okay. It's okay. It's just uh, the hazard of the job. You know, when you when you put that hand out there and you're trying to stop 270. 280-pound defensive ends for over 20 years. Uh, I'm glad that it's just one finger that looks like that. So. Okay. We have a couple of pressing uh, questions. This gentleman up front. Okay. How you doing, Anthony? Good. How you doing? I mean, this is kind of personal, but I think it's That's a motivational fine. thing, too. Um, what would the starting salary be or back then when you started yearly? Okay. I mean, I don't know if you can answer that or not. But no, I don't mind that. Answer. What would the starting salary Okay. 1980, I was the third pick of the entire draft, and my rookie salary was $80,000, which is, I mean, coming from where I came, I mean, I was, that was like I hit the lottery. Now for the third pick, you're probably yeah. looking at what, 10 to 15 yeah. million? A little bit more. Yeah. <laughs> Great question. There's a question in the back. Mr. Munoz, was yes, there sir. ever a time where you had to face your fear and move past the fear and just learn techniques to deal with your fear? A time so, when you had to face your fear? Yes. Um, there's been several um, incidents where I've had to, you know, public speaking is one of them. Uh, going out in front of, uh, you know, 100,000 people to play a game and, and not wanting to fail. Uh, but I've not met any successful people that have not failed. I mean, you got to go out there and you got to give it a shot. And failing is part of it, as it was asked earlier about you know losing. Uh, you got to have the courage to go out and try something and, and understand that you're going to fail, and you got to get through that. You know, the fear of going out and doing something. And uh, you know, if you'd have told me when I was your age, or even in college, or even in early in my football career, that I would be speaking as many times as I do per year in front of as many people, I'd have said you're nuts. There's no way that I'll have the courage. And in the first several times I went out to speak, uh, you know, I was, I was moving a little more. I was a little perspiration, or not a little sweating. But uh, it, it's, you do things and you get over that fear. And, uh, and that's what I'd encourage you. If, if you really want to do something but you're afraid of failing, just do it. Because then, you know, your confidence is built. And it's kind of like earlier when I talked about all the temptation out there. And if you might be the only one that's not doing it. I'm sure there's some fear there of being, you know, the outcast, being the only one that being ridiculed because you're not part of the group. Well, the more you, you do that and you overcome that fear of not getting involved in those things that might harm you, that's the same type of thing. Great. 
Well, I'm going to relinquish the podium and let Anthony make his final remarks of things he'd like you to remember from today's session. But as I do that, I want to, uh, again, thank all of you for coming. I understand you're going to have an opportunity to tour the Hall of Fame and see all the history and the um, videos of the great Hall of Famers that are up there. So enjoy your day, and I'll turn it over to you, Anthony. Thank you, Stephen. And, um, you know, just a, a couple things about Stephen Perry, uh, when you have a team, you always have some great leaders leading the team. And the thing that has impressed me about the staff here at the Hall of Fame, and, and I try to stay as, as involved as I possibly can with events like this, coming up uh, every Hall of Fame induction weekend, and we have a golf tournament in September that's a fundraiser, and I try to really make it every year, is that we have a great leader uh, leading the staff here at the the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And, and let's give uh, Steve Perry a, a big round of applause. And I see a lot of the other, some of the other staff that work here make this place what it is, and, and, uh, and I appreciate uh, each and every one of them. But it, it does, it takes leaders. Um, as we wrap it up in my closing remarks, I do want to make it totally clear that um, I take this opportunity not to stand before you and to, to tell you that everything I say is, is the right thing or the way that you should do everything exactly that way and that I know all the answers, but I share from my heart. I share from experiences of those that have taught me, things that have worked in my life uh, that allowed me to be successful in different areas. And, uh, you know, for over 20 years, I was a football player. And all of a sudden, I retired at the age of 35. And the one thing I learned 20 years ago when I retired is that a lot of the things that I learned in the game of football, teamwork, communication, responsibility, um, have helped me out in the business world. I own two small companies. I head up a, a foundation, as Steve mentioned. So I'm in charge of doing a lot of things. Things that, you know, 20 years ago, if you would have said I was going to be in charge of hiring employees, evaluations, raising money, uh, a lot of things that I'm learning, I said, I don't think so. But because of the things I learned as an athlete, hard work, dedication, preparation, uh, I'm enjoying what I'm doing now. Uh, and again, in business, you're not always going to win. There's some losses there. You lose bids in business when you're selling things to other companies. But again, as the young lady asked about losing, you take that, you learn how to do things better, and then next time you, you have a chance to bid, uh, on something, you're going to be better prepared. So, uh, so I'd encourage you to take what you have through your, all your information and really start to apply that in your life. And, uh, and like I said, it doesn't happen overnight. It's about making it a habit, making it something that you work on not only every day, but continually throughout the day. And, uh, and it's no different than becoming, you know, an attorney or a teacher or a or an athlete, you have to practice. You have to make it a habit. And there's a lot of times, as I said earlier, the details, uh, there might be some little details that you might not believe are that important. But in the big picture, they're very important. So uh, again, I appreciate this opportunity just to interact and to talk to you. And, and hopefully, I know Stephen and things he shared, and hopefully some of the things I've shared, that, uh, that you'll take a, a lot of that back and start to implement that into your life. And uh, if you haven't already started to do that as a, as a young adult. So again, thank you for being here and enjoy your time here.